You may be wondering why it's taken me so long to bring you a review of Breath of the Wild. I mean, this is a Nintendo-centric channel, I like doing reviews, and for me, Breath of the Wild is without a doubt the biggest game of the decade. Well, that's actually why it's taken me so long. This is a very special game to me. It was obvious from the get-go that I wasn't gonna rush through it in order to put out a timely review. And I certainly didn't want to do a review at all without giving the game my all, without experiencing everything it had to offer. I mean, I don't usually go all crazy on games before reviewing them. I beat them and play them as much as I feel I need to to give an informed opinion, but rarely do I have the desire to pick them apart so completely as I'm about to pick apart this game, to dig into every single aspect that I feel is worth talking about. And now, since it's finally time for me to review Breath of the Wild, I want to touch on every one of those aspects without worrying about spending too much time on any one thing and losing a viewer's interest. I don't want to worry about making a single review that's so long it'll put some people off from watching it altogether. So I've decided to split this review into multiple parts and release them over a period of time. That way, not only can I take all the time I need on every detail and give it to you all in an easily digestible format, but I can start giving you parts to watch as I finish them, rather than going a whole month or two without releasing any other videos so I can finish it all at once. Obviously, this is going to be a spoilery review. A very spoilery review. The most spoilery review possible, in fact. See, in my eyes, there are two types of reviews. Ones that get published close to the release of a game so that potential buyers can learn what the game's about and hear what journalists think about it, and ones that are published after the fact and offer what is usually a more in-depth look at the game. You might even call it an analysis or a video essay. The former is all about being topical. It's all about making informed purchasing decisions. Do people like this game? Is it good enough to buy? Do I think I'll like it? But the latter type is a little deeper. It's for people with a great interest not only in a game's quality or surface features, but in all the individual elements that make it what it is. To put it simply, you watch those kinds of reviews, analyses, video essays, what have you, because you like to hear people talk a bunch about a game you like. And once I crossed over into the latter territory, I knew I had to really do this. Virtually no one is still thinking of buying Breath of the Wild and hunting down reviews to make an informed decision. That kind of person is basically extinct. Right now, now you've got an earth filled with people who already have the game, or who know exactly how crazy everyone is for it and are just waiting for the right time to pick up a Switch or whatever. Especially considering that this is Breath of the Wild we're talking about. There hasn't been so much press surrounding a Nintendo game since... I, I don't know, has there ever been so much press surrounding a Nintendo game? I highly doubt a whole lot of people are still in the dark about whether or not they should buy it. That's why this review is for you. It's for my fans and for the other fine folks who might just be passing by. The folks who like to hear what I think about games or to hear what people in general think about this game because this game is, like I said, something very special. Two more notes real quick. First, I understand this is gonna be a whole lot of video to watch. While there are definitely going to be fun visual elements to help illustrate my points as usual, the vast majority of this review can be enjoyed without the visuals so it is house cleaning and long car ride friendly if that helps at all. Second, if you do want to watch it though, you're in for a treat because the visual elements were all edited by Kane from Farfetched Reviews. He does great work and in fact his own channel is really excellent and I highly suggest checking it out. We share a lot of opinions. With all that said, I think it's time to get started. And as I'm here doing this introduction, I might as well start things off by telling you about what is, in my opinion, the game's most important aspect. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you my Breath of the Wild review series. When Breath of the Wild was first revealed back at E3, back when we still referred to it as Zelda U, I watched the reveal teaser. Later that year, I watched the precious few moments of gameplay gifted unto us at the Game Awards. Two whole E3s later, they gave us the full reveal trailer with the game's name and basic mechanics and some monsters and locales. And that was the stop of the Breath of the Wild preview tour where I got off. I did not want to see anymore. Unfortunately, stuff inevitably slipped through the cracks. Whenever a juicy new trailer popped up in a Nintendo Direct or something, I always peeked between my fingers here and there, and sure enough, every time I did, something was spoiled and I regretted it horribly. I've talked about this before, but if you're not aware, I am hypersensitive to spoilery material. To me, a spoiler isn't just, this character dies at the end, or it turns out it was all a dream. To me, a spoiler is anything that I would have delighted in discovering for myself. If I know everything there is to know about a game going in, every kind of guy I'm gonna fight, every item I'm gonna get, every place I'm gonna see, a lot of the magic is gone. The simple act of playing out a video game isn't the only important thing to me. I want a game, especially a game as huge and important as Breath of the Wild, to be like an experience, an event in my life, something 
special. So I went in as blind as I reasonably could as a guy who talks about games on YouTube. And I'll tell you right now, I'm so, so glad I did. Breath of the Wild is obviously a great game all on its own. Spoiler alert, by the way, uh, it's a great game. But I'm not exaggerating when I say that an immeasurably huge amount of my enjoyment came from not knowing much going in. While I basically never like to know too much about any game, avoiding spoilers had never before meant as much as it did here. And that's because no other game I've played has contained such a wealth of delightful things to discover. You see, I'd always dreamed of this massive game where you could just go wherever you wanted and the world was beautiful and magical and you'd actually find interesting stuff. I would run through the world of Shadow of the Colossus, thinking this is so close. It was visually spectacular, it was enormous, it got my imagination running wild, but beyond 16 colossi, which you had to hunt down in order, and I guess like fruit and lizards and stuff to eat to increase your gauges, there was simply nothing to find. It was just a set. A really big, beautiful, amazing set, but a set. There was nothing really to do except enjoy the scenery. And of course, some other open world games have gotten close to delivering what I wanted. Take a game like Skyrim, for instance, which is huge, beautiful, filled with quests, and completely open for you to explore at your own pace. It's hard to pin down exactly why Skyrim didn't quite do it for me. I love, love, loved it, but it didn't contain that certain kind of magic I was looking for. It could be because most of the game boiled down to killing guys and looting them. Find a cave or a dungeon or a sewer or anything, run through it and kill the guys and grab all the loot. Plenty of surprising stuff to come upon, and that's why it was certainly close, but something was still missing. Breath of the Wild, though, is the game I was waiting for all those years. And really, it's surprising that it turned out that way. When Aonuma claimed that the Great Plateau, the huge, sprawling area available to play around in at hands-on events, was only about 1% of the total map, I think more than a few of us grew a little concerned. I mean, how much stuff can you possibly develop for a world that big? How can there be enough to actually do? Because it doesn't matter if a game world is a thousand miles across if you're just running forever and not finding anything. But the Zelda team pulled it off. They made the world beautiful and teeming with interesting geography and ruined buildings and just a wide assortment of unique sites to happen upon, and they also packed it to the gills with dudes to kill and stuff to loot, but the two things that make Breath of the Wild the game I always wanted to play are shrines and Koroks. And I think it's because, for one, they're just all over the place. 120 shrines and 900 Koroks mean the world is just packed with them. There's no place in Hyrule where you'll just not come upon shrines and Koroks, meaning that no matter where you find yourself, you're always on the hunt. But more importantly though, they so perfectly satisfy my exploration craving because they strike a balance between useful and fun to find. See, if useful stuff is scattered everywhere and all you gotta do is pick it up, it's not as fun. The game becomes a collectathon at that point. The idea is just to kind of waste your time. But then if there's stuff that actually takes thought to find, but that stuff isn't really that useful, then well, what's the point in looking for it? Also much less fun. Shrines and Koroks though? They're perfect. Shrines because they give you spirit orbs, four of which can be exchanged for either another heart container or an extra bit on your stamina meter. Hearts mean more here than they have in any other 3D Zelda by far, and stamina aids in your ability to move through the world, climbing higher surfaces and gliding further primarily. And of course, each shrine is just a fun challenge to beat, which we'll touch more on later, but that's what makes them even more satisfying to find. Then Koroks are great because they increase the number of weapons and shields you can hold, and in this world of breakable stuff, this just makes you stronger. It takes more and more Korok seeds for each pouch upgrade, and you'll be maxed out after getting roughly half of them, but as long as it's making any difference at all, I am pleased as punch to obtain each one. And let's talk some more about why the finding of these things is so much fun, starting with shrines. Out of everything the game offers, shrines keep things the most interesting. They provide the most unique scenarios. They require so many different things of you to be uncovered. It can be rolling a snowball on the right path down a hill so it crashes open a door, lighting some inconspicuous torches, tracking down and taking pictures of statue fragments, defeating a family of Hinoxes, getting a group of Rito kids together to sing a song. The list goes on and on and on. I can't even properly describe how awesome it felt to set foot on Eventide Isle, or in that one place where it's super dark, or in any of the great labyrinths. It was such a huge rush. It was the sense that I'd discovered something really awesome and was now faced with some sort of fun challenge. Some of these shrines offer nice loot, but for the most part, the prize is always the same, a spirit orb. 
Again though, I never care. Spirit orbs are incredibly useful and earning them by doing all this crazy stuff just makes the whole thing that much more fun. It's this feeling of constant reward no matter where I'm going or what I'm doing. And you know me, I feel that variety is the spice of video games. If all the shrines are fun and interesting to find, the fact that they come in so many different packages just multiplies that fun. Plenty of them, of course, are simply sitting in plain sight, and this is great. It's something of a palate cleanser between trickier shrines. You don't want to get completely tired of solving riddles and doing obscure stuff, and it's great that you can mark them from a distance so you can just come back to them later when you want to accomplish something a little more straightforward. Plus, seeing them from towers is just exciting. Whenever you stand up on a tower you've just unlocked and you spot all those red blobs all around you, you're invigorated by the task at hand, by the idea of pressing into a gigantic new territory. But, of course, even better, there's this unmatched sense of wonder when you're just running around in the mountains doing nothing and you see something weird and you go, what on earth is that? And you investigate for a while, then wonder turns to joy and triumph when you realize that yes, it's a shrine! My first time through, I especially loved Cass's riddles. Most of them were pretty easy to solve, but there were a few that made me feel awesome when I got to the bottom of things. If I had to pick a favorite, it would probably be the one where you have to find a spot where you can shoot an arrow through two of those stones with holes in them. I love to sit around and ponder in any game. I love to stare at a problem from all different angles and think about it for a while. And of course, that was a challenge that was so unlike the rest of them. There were so many that were so unlike the rest of them. Next, of course, we got the Koroks, and it's funny because they're so much less flashy and substantial than shrines. I mean, with one, you've got a jillion-year-old structure rising up out of the earth and taking you down into a trial meant to test the legendary hero with all sorts of weird magical technology, and with the other, you pick up a rock and it's like, poof, haha, <laughs> you found me, here's a seed, bye! But the effect these little creatures had on me, especially in the early hours of the game, was immense. If shrines instilled within me a sense of wonder, Koroks instilled a childish delight that was just as strong and just as magical. Just like with shrines, this is largely because there are just so many of them hidden throughout the world. Outside of the Divine Beasts, there is no place in the entire game world where you can't find some Koroks if you look hard enough. It means that running through nearly my entire experience with the game, there was this constant knowledge that I might find something at any moment, a constant need to pay attention to my surroundings. They also act as a system of constant micro rewards for simply running and climbing and looking wherever you can, like a kid playing out in the forest. Climb a mountain? Have a Korok! Look inside a hollow log? Have a Korok! Make your way to the tippiest, most tippy top of Hyrule Castle? Well, look at that! On top of your own sense of accomplishment, how about a Korok for your troubles? No good deed goes unrewarded. Also as it is with shrines, it's very important that on top of their immense numbers, there are also an immense number of ways to find them. There are so many that even now, after over 200 hours of Breath of the Wild, I'm still not certain I've seen every kind of hiding place. Every time I think I've seen them all, I find something weird and poof, another one. Didn't see that coming, did ya? I called it childish delight because like a child is exactly how I feel when I track one of the little guys down. I feel like shouting, on you! <laughs> they turn this huge world into a great big toy, or a game on top of a game. Try to remember what it felt like when you were little, and you opened a mysterious Christmas gift to find something cool inside, or you pressed a button on a toy and were delighted by what it did. For me, that's the same kind of feeling I get when I see something a little off, and I go, nah, I'm sure it's nothing. But then I check it out anyway, and I fiddle with it, still going, no, I really don't think this is anything. I think I'm making this up. And then I put a rock where I feel like it should be, and poof! It was totally a Korok! And the kid inside of me squeals with glee like a toddler when their dad pops up from behind the couch with a silly face. And Nintendo knew this was how I'd feel, too. It was completely deliberate. Why else would they include a victory chime and that little poof? It's straight up like one of those party poppers. It's meant to instantly hit you with that happy feeling of winning a prize. Shrines and Koroks may be the main attractions when it comes to exploration, but even beyond those, the game still has more surprises in store. And again, if I'd known about any of this ahead of time, none of it would have had a big impact on me. I had to immerse myself in the world and stumble upon it all naturally in order to really feel that sense of wonder. Here were some of my favorite surprises. The first time I came upon a Yiga foot soldier disguised as a traveler, I'm talking to some friendly girl and suddenly she cheerily says something about killing the legendary hero and I'm like, what now? And then she tells me she's gonna bring her 
plaster my head and turns into a stinking ninja and attacks me. I would have never seen that coming in a million years. It was so out of the blue and really pretty scary for a Zelda game. It's just like, this is not a monster. This human person wants to murder me. Then the dragons. Oh man, this was a big one. I'm walking along one day and I spot some long little squirmy wormy thing up in the sky, way out in the distance. I, I can't even see what it is and it disappears. Okay, weird. Later I'm walking and I see the thing closer and I see, oh, what is that? I look a little bit, oh yeah, it's a big, big, big dragon just flying around on its own. I have no idea if it's good or bad or wants to eat me or just wants to chill up there. But really seeing it for the first time gave me goosebumps. It was incredible. It was one of those really intense this game moments. You know, when you're really blown away by a game and it just keeps surprising you and you can only go, this game, man, this game. Then later I'm doing stuff up on the northern edge of Death Mountain and suddenly there's a strange breeze. Huh, I wonder what- ah! The divine beasts were similar to the dragons. I had no idea at all that they existed, not a clue, and I'm so glad because finding these things and coming to terms with the fact that there were utterly gigantic robotic beasts just chilling around Hyrule was mind blowing. It was the kind of pure, just coolness that I adore. Vamedo hangs out up in the sky and it was always this weird little speck that I had no idea what it was. I even remembered seeing it in trailers and stuff, just this weird little thing hanging up in the distance. And at some point I finally got close enough to get a good look at it and holy cow it's a bird it's a giant robot bird i am not getting near that thing then you've got varudania which circles around death mountain and this one was fun it was a happy coincidence that for a very large amount of the game it just happened to be on the other side of the mountain whenever i looked because then one random time i'm just surveying the landscape and i look at death mountain from super far away mind you just looking at this gigantic mountain rising up out of the earth the tallest point on the map and suddenly something starts moving a creature, easily visible from where I am, is crawling around the mountain. And the feeling in my gut is equal parts wonder and horror. Another good horrific one was the first time I saw Lionel. The Zora just kept telling me about some beast way up on the mountain and how I would need to go get shock arrows from it. This in itself was scary and weird because they were talking about it like a, well, a, a beast. <laughs> An animal, and animals don't have the capacity to shoot you with a bow and arrow. Only sapient creatures can do that. So what in the heck was this thing anyway? The anticipation climbing up that mountain was intense. Turning the corner, I had just absolutely positively no idea what I expected to see. Then finally seeing it, and most importantly, seeing how easily it could murder me from a mile away was purely terrifying. And I know I mentioned the labyrinths already, but I can't stress enough how awesome they are. I found the one on the top right corner of the map first, and it was this huge weird square of something out in the distance. I didn't even think I could reach it, but after I flew there, I felt like I'd busted into some weird ancient prison and was about to be blasted by a guardian at any second. It was one of the most thrilling experiences I've had in a Zelda the game. Look, I could go on and on, but you get the idea here. I just can't believe they managed to make a game this big with so many things to discover. So many things that are delightful or scary or breathtaking. Again and again and again, you're thrown into scenarios and you just have no idea what's about to happen. If there was one phrase I uttered most during my time with Breath of the Wild, it was, what on earth? So many times, so many times I would spot something weird and that's what I would say. What on earth? What is that? And running ahead to find out was always a magical feeling. There's still a lot to talk about with this game. Combat, art style, story, all that video gamey stuff. But I don't think any of it's as important as that magic. It's what makes the game more than just a great game. It's what makes it a special game. An experience that I'll probably carry with me for the rest of my life. Because even if Nintendo or another developer makes another game that's just as magical, or even more so, Breath of the Wild will always be a first. Exploration has always been one of my favorite things about video games as a whole, and Breath of the Wild will always be the first time exploration in a game was everything I wanted it to be. The first time I played a game that I had previously only dreamed of.